we lost four people that day. As our men approached the dam, uh, they were casting a rope to try to have the boy get a hold of it. And uh, in the process, uh, the rope became fouled, so they extended a pike pole. And the man on the oars, to get closer to the boy, rode in with the boat on top of the boil, the front of the boat. And as the boy grabbed the pike pole, he pulled the boat forward rather than the body being, or the boy being pulled out. The boat was pulled into the hydraulic of the dam and uh, bumped the face of the dam. Now the man on the oars was a fairly good sized man, about 6'3 and in excess of 225 pounds. And he pulled very hard on his oars and actually pulled the boat away from the dam several feet. Uh, at that point, one of his oars snapped and the boat was swept back against the dam, filled with water and capsized. And uh, at that point, we had a much worse situation we had prior to this and it was, could only be worked from shore to try to uh, save them. We were able to retrieve one of our men. We lost the other two. The low head dams are a perfect, that's why they're called a killer dam, they're a perfect grounding machine because not only are you rolling in this, it's not broken anywhere. Since it's not broken anywhere, there's nowhere for you to make an exit. There's no up or down stream Vs to work or anything like that. You've got a, a, the perfect face and the perfect boil below it. And all you can do is work laterally in this, get to the edge, and then many times what are you confronted with? A sheer concrete wall. You're not going to get out. The hydraulic. Whenever water flows over a drop, it hits the water below it, pushing it downstream. You get a hole in the surface of the water that's got to be filled. The downstream water rushes in to fill it. That's the danger, that recirculating current. As you can see from this model, anything, boats or people, anything caught in this recirculating current will be trapped. At the downstream edge of the hydraulic is the boil. Here, the water wells up from the bottom and rushes upstream, back to the dam. But water from the same place is rushing downstream. Where the two currents separate, that's the boil. I was operating the first boat in, and the victim was trapped in the dam. He'd went over the dam in a rubber raft and uh, was trapped there in the hydraulic right at the dam. As we moved into the victim, our boat was just seemed to raise about a foot in the water itself. The, the water was so turbulent and aerated, our boat just raised up. We lost all control. I went to full reverse, wide open throttle, had no control whatsoever, and our boat was pulled right into the spillway. The water filled the boat, and our boat capsized. The second boat left the shore, the smaller boat, and as they came in, we started hollering at them, you know, to get out, put it reverse and get out. They didn't have the power in their engine. They were already committed, and it pulled them in just like it did us. Uh, like I said, we were trapped. We were in there for approximately, I'd say, in a neighborhood of 25 minutes or so. And a bystander that had seen what had happened, uh, he's a local sports rider, lives about a mile and a half, two miles from here, ran home, got his 14-foot rowboat, and came back. The difference was they tied a rope to his boat before it was put in. He had no motor, it was strictly done by oars, and he would row out, the first victim out was the captain, Captain Dennis, he was the closest to the shoreline. He got to him, and then they just, the guys on the shore pulled the rope and pulled him out. Same thing over again. And each time he'd start to get sucked into the spillway, they'd pull him out with the rope. And by working this mechanism, they were able to, to get us all out, all except naturally the victim, he died, and one firefighter, Kermit Smith, died in the accident. Firefighters, rescue squad personnel, and indeed law enforcement personnel are being killed at the scene of these fast water uh, emergency situations, specifically those involving low head dams because the, uh, the water is, is so deceptive and it's a uh, first appraisal and that uh, the fire rescue personnel don't hesitate to go in 
to try and rescue somebody who is caught in this this drowning machine, this this hydraulic at the at the base of these dams. They themselves get caught in the dam, and we are having fire department funerals. The idea is that these techniques don't jeopardize you. We don't want anybody in the boil. We Attacking the problem here, directly, you know, watercraft board, officers from the state of Ohio have been working with fire and rescue workers at the Ohio Fire Academy. Under the direction of Jim French, they've developed a program to teach safe rescue techniques. There's a great chance that the, the situation is going to be a rescue rather than a recovery, and we want to try and gear people up for that. At the same time, the course and the material that we present is based on safe rescues. The rescues are based on proven principles of boating safety. Know the river. Training begins with knowing the river. Don't try and push off the bottom. Just try and use your arms and your legs in the water and bolt up on top. Knowing your own limitations. Right you can't save other people if you don't know how to save yourself. Always have an adequate backup. A safety man in position. Always have an out. Bury in the shore. Good job. Define what the boil is. It's kind of hard to see from here, but it's about 10 feet this side of the dam. And it's where the water's flowing towards the dam and downstream. Know the river, know yourself, and have a plan. How long do you think it should take you to set that static line up? Well, you've got a guy trapped on that tree out there. You want to be plenty safe, so you want to... You've got to plan, and you've got to practice. Practice, practice, practice. What it boils down to is this. Uh, knowledge, training, and planning. It's imperative that rescue people who might be called out to this type of situation uh, scout their areas, find out where these things are likely to occur, Check out your rivers, check out the dams in all its moods and in all the different seasons and plan and train. No matter what technique you use, the principles remain the same. Always go for simplicity. Whenever you arrive at a site, say first of all, okay, there's four things we can do. We can do, we can talk the person in self-rescue. If we can't do that, then we can assist them somehow. We can throw a line to them, we can do, um, a shore assisted rescue where everybody stays safe they stay right here on the shore if that doesn't work then maybe you could go to a boat assisted rescue you put the boat in but you just use it more or less to position lines you use it to get a line across the water for a static line the boat stays out of the danger zone at all times as long as you're on the downstream side if you capsize then you're going to be washed clear of the dam. There's no danger. The fourth type rescue and the most dangerous one is when you do the boat-based rescue. That's when you have the boats actually in the water, you're performing the rescue from the boats. That's the last resort. You should always try everything else before you ever go to a boat-based rescue. It's the maneuverability. You can use new devices such as the rescue deck, but don't abandon tested principles. Know the river, Know yourself, plan, and practice. Pam, you go with her. The most important the technique the Ohio Division of Watercraft developed is the boat-assisted rescue of a victim at a low head dam. We've got one victim reported in the water. Uh, let's go get him. Okay. Okay. It takes a minimum team of seven rescuers. A captain directs the team from shore. One backup man is stationed on the near shore and one on the far shore. Two rescuers in one boat ferry the life float line to the opposite shore, and two rescuers in a second boat provide backup. The rescuers from the first boat will go ashore while those in the backup boat return to the near shore. The four rescue people maneuver the life float across the face of the dam to the victim. Here you see it in operation. The captain on the near shore the backup man on the far shore, the four rescuers. Randy, try to keep that line off the water. Keep the Jim Bowie up here. The backup man brings the line up, okay, back to boat, take off. attaches it to the life float. The rescuers take the line across. Come back 
Canadian bag of boats are secure. The rescuers in the lead boat join the backup man. The rescuers in the backup boat return to the far shore to help. Let's turn down these lights and see if we can lift the boat up over the top of it. Conscious victims able to cling to the life float would be pulled out of the hydraulic, across the boil and into the downstream current, and then to shore immediately. Pull them your way. The life float is rigged to cling to victims unable to help themselves but they might be torn from the life float in the powerful currents of the boil and swept back to the face of the dam. So the rescuers pull them across the face of the dam to shore to get them to safety as quickly as possible. Move down the wall a little bit. <coughs> Let's tie that gym boy off on that side, bring the victim back over. Randy, come on back up and tie it off. Just let it go in the hydraulic. Now, sometimes this technique won't work. Maybe the river is too wide to get a line across. For those situations, you can use the two-boat tether. Again, you need a seven-man rescue team. The lead rescue boat is tethered to the backup boat. Both boats approach the dam from downstream. The captain is stationed in line with a boil where he directs the rescue operation and makes certain that the lead boat does not cross the boil. Okay, let's bring those tethered boats up. Well, yeah, the bow of the boat should go no farther than me. I'll tell you if you're going too far up. So be sure to keep your established distance set. As they are about to pull in the victim, they cut the lead boat's engine, so the victim can't drift into the whirling propeller. Back farther, Bill. Back farther. That's good. In the rescue failures that we've had a chance to investigate, we found that the firemen, as they approached the boil, the hydraulic at the base of the dam, actually felt confident that they were going to be able to perform the rescue and were completely unfamiliar with the fact that the tremendous power of water was going to draw them up into the face of the dam, regardless of how powerful their motor was. They were confident in their skills also and found out too late that the technique they had planned to use, a direct contact with the victim, was going to put them uh, in a situation where they're trapped again with the victims. Binghamton, New York. September 29, 1975. A television news team videotaped this attempt to recover the body of a fireman drowned during a rescue the day before. The boat is approaching the boil. Is that the fire chief in the boat? The guy standing up. Two of the men are now lost. More than an hour has passed since the victim first entered the water. A number of shore base attempts to save him have failed. Hey, he hang on to the boat, fight. kid. God, hang on to the boat. No. Come on, kid, fight. Come on. Get him out of the water. Here they come. The second boat crosses the boil. Pops out this time, should be able to grab him. Watch this boat. There, there goes that boat. That boat's gonna go over. That boat's gonna go over. Huh? Is that Tommy? There's 
The boat has broken the uniform current of the hydraulic, and all three men are slowly washed out alive. That guy's gonna get out. Three others are dead. That's what they should all do, try to get out. There's whirlpools throughout. It would suck you down, it would hold you, it would move you along the bottom. Uh, you'd be torn through debris and so forth, battered and bruised, and then all of a sudden it'd just push you to the top. You had, there was no, no ability to swim. There's nothing you could do for yourself. You just had to go with it. Um, it's like a monster's got a hold of you and there's just nothing you can do, nothing at all. It doesn't look dangerous, just like this does not look particularly dangerous. But the danger is there. It's hidden from you. You just never want to eliminate the door. You always want the way out. Practice is, is the key to being able to complete a successful rescue on cue.